Awesome. How is everybody? Doing all right? Good. So for those who weren't here on Sunday morning, my name is Marty. My wife is Bridget back there. And we oversee Canada for JJLM. So it's kind of cold there, so it's good to be down here. It's, I think it's like 40 degrees colder there than it is here right now, so it's good. Um, we're having a great time here. Love this family. Love this church. It's fantastic. Um, so we're going to look at some things today. Uh, if you, again, if you weren't here on Sunday morning, I give a bit of a testimony of how our lives changed by hearing this message about five years ago. At the end of this month, it'll be five years that my dad passed away in Mexico trying to get this message into him. You know, Satan doesn't like this because he doesn't like truth. And most churches and every church that we ever belong to, we are a part of boards, we help pastor churches, all this stuff. It's just, honestly, almost a waste of time. You know, the people weren't. Great people, nice people, all that kind of stuff. Just couldn't give me truth. So we spent 17 years sitting in churches trying to find truth. And I always knew there was something wrong. And so did Bridget. And uh, towards the end of going to church, I love church, by the way. We spend 90% of our time in church. You know, people think we're anti-church. We're not anti-church or else we wouldn't have, you know, conferences every weekend. You know, we're anti-religion. You know, false religion, because religion kills people. Religion separates people. Religion breaks up families. You know, religion literally will take and suck the life right out of you. You know, the, the, the emotional life, the spiritual life, and sometimes your own physical life. You know, because you just can't live under that weight of oppression that religion puts on you. And this is where I live mostly. But towards the end of it, she was like, I, I can't stay here anymore. Like, if we stay in church... You know, someone may get hurt, you know, because she was just fed up, you know. And then so we went away for a little bit and then we'd go back to church and we'd, we'd leave for six months or something and go back to church just to see, you know, what's changed. And I found that church was really like a soap opera for the most part, you know, like I'll admit it. I admit it, I admit it on camera before, I'll admit it again. Almost 30 years ago, I used to watch Days of Our Lives. <laughs> There's no condemnation here, right? Okay. And I used to, you know? And every once in a while, if I'm going to turn on the news or something, I like to watch maybe the first 10 minutes of the news to see what afraid people are doing. So turn that on. And sometimes you catch the tail end of a soap opera or something. It's exactly the same people doing exactly the same thing. They're just older and grayer. And that's how most churches are. They just do the exact same thing, the exact same people. You know, it's the exact same people coming up for a prophetic word or, you know, to get healing or, or to confess some sort of sin or something that they've been in for 30 years. That's broken. It is absolutely broken. And it's, it's time that, that churches stand up. And people don't come to church to, to, to get. They come to church to give, you know. See, we come in, well, I better get a word or I better get my healing and I better get this or I better get... How about you come and give? give? You've got the eternal life in you. You've got Jesus Christ in you. You've got to give. But we're always coming in. Why, why do we come in so broken? You know, we have that. We all have the same thing in us. So, but I lived in that for so long, and it was not fun at all. And so finally, we, we, we would go, and we come and go and all that. And then we started to get this message in us, and then we'd go to church. And the pastor would be up there saying what he says. And I would, I would that's not true. And she'd be like, shh, stop. And I'd, I'd bump her in the leg. That's not true. So finally, we had to leave. You know, and, and God actually gave me a dream. And in the dream, I was, we were in our home. And this, this, actually, this dream actually goes on with the, uh, along with a prophetic word we had years before that. I'm not really big on, like, I love the prophetic. Absolutely love it. But it's, but it's not the, whatever he calls it, path of... Prof. Line. Prof. Line, that's what it is. Um, and I don't like the pathetic. I like the prophetic. Right, but a lot of times we hear the pathetic. You know, God's gonna give you robes of, you know, scarlet red and crown you with a crown. Oh, come on, give me a break. Give me something that's gonna change my life. So we, in this dream, I was in my home, and uh, someone knocked on our door. So I went to the front door, and there was all these people outside, and I thought, I don't want anybody in my house right now. I don't want, and I didn't have a choice. They came in through the door. They came in through the window. They came to, to get to us. And that's in alignment with this prophetic word we got because the guy said, people are going to fall in following you, right? And it goes along with what Brother Curry was saying yesterday, you know, that people will come to you 
because it's the same thing with Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. So they came in, and then they, they were surrounding our house and in our house, and we didn't have a choice. These people just wanted to come in and hear truth. And then we went out to the backyard, and way off in the distance, I saw uh, people walking on a lake, and they, it was on ice, and I knew the ice was, it was thin, and they were going to fall through, and I wanted to go rescue them. So I, I went a long way out there through all this wooded area, got to the end, and I was way over the lake, and underneath, it, it looked like there was a, a ledge coming out. But I didn't know at the time, just underneath that, all, there was a tree there, and all the tree roots were out at the bottom. So there was nothing holding the tree. There was a facade, which is religion, because it's not rooted in anything. It's a facade. It looks like the tree is in the ground. It looked like stable ground, but it's not. And then just before I, the, the tree broke and fell, I, that's when I saw underneath that had it eroded away, and there was nothing there but a ledge, and all the roots were hanging out. And I went to the end, and I fell, and the great was the fall. And I fell with the tree into um, the lake now because the lake, the, the water, they had fallen through and now it was actual moving water. Fell into the water and then all of a sudden I was with these three people that were in the water. And God said to me in the dream, if you stay with these people, you will not watch your new self drown and you'll never recover. Because that was the new me that came out. And the new me, what I mean by that is not the saved me, but the non-religious me. The, the one that understood who Christ is. And he said, if you stay there, you will drown and you'll never recover because that religion will come back on, on you again. So I was like, I woke up, I thought, well, it's pretty profound, you know. Everything God says is profound, you know. And anyway, we, I went to church uh, a couple of weeks later during worship. God said, do you remember that dream I gave you? I said, yeah. He said, this is that church. If you stay here, you'll die. See ya. You know, and again, wonderful people. I, I get no issues. I'd still talk to some of them. I mean, wonderful. But I couldn't stay there because now I had life. You know, and I remember uh, going to church one morning. I woke up, and the first thing God spoke to me. Did God ever speak to you first thing in the morning? It's because your mind isn't full of business that day or the day's affairs or whatever. Woke up that morning. The first thing He said to me is, "Why are Christians running after me?" Or why are Christians chasing me? I'm not running from them. And I was like, huh, cool. That's profound. Again, everything God says is profound. Then we went to church. Get to church, settle into your favorite seat. You know, everybody's got a spot. And if somebody, a newcomer comes in, they sit in your spot. You're like, what are you sitting in my spot for? You know? And then you end up staring at them the whole service. What are you sitting in my spot? Anyway. And uh, so we're, we're sitting, there, sitting there, and the first song comes up. On the overhead, God, as we call it, the projection screen, chasing after you. God knew what song it was going to be to help me get out of that because I was always chasing God. You've never chased God. God has always chased you. God, God is always the one that looked in your window, knocked on your door, and was creeping around your house, you know, to find you. And I was, you know, religion always has you chasing something. Religion always has you chasing revival. You know, everything's all about revival. You are revival. You know, only a dead person needs a revival. You don't bring an alive person into a hospital and say, could you revive my friend? A dead person. The world needs revival. The church doesn't need revival. What we want is revival in the church. What most Christians want is revival in the church so people can come in here and roll around like a bunch of Tootsie Rolls. You know, they would roll on the ground and create these fire tunnels and do all this and then go home and say, wow, what a great service. It wasn't a great service. Nobody got saved. Nobody got healed. Nobody got delivered. It was just a bunch of yelling and screaming and flopping around like you caught the Holy Ghost. You can't catch the Holy Ghost. He lives in you. Right? But you have all these, you know, Holy Ghost. Like, and then you run. Anyway, I don't want to get into that too much because this stuff just bothers me, you know? And the more flipping, flopping around you do, I guess the greater the service is. Nah, how much truth was spoken? And what's... what's what, do you think that pleases God? To, to have a pe bunch of people flopping around like fish out of water? What does that do? Show me where that's biblical. Show me where the disciples or the apostles created a fire tunnel. Show me anywhere in scripture where, where people came to Jesus, the apostles, disciples, I need those people for inner healing. It never took place. Like, like Brother Curry was talking about yesterday, sozo, theophostics, all that stuff. That's to deal with the, with the, 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 the psyche. It's not dealing with the spirit. Psychologists cannot, I don't care if you call it Christian psychology, 
It's psychology that came from the world. And that's the problem with the church because they're powerless to help people. Yes. And the truth of the matter is, when you get saved, you are in or healed. 100%. You may not feel like it, because you're, but when the Bible talks about it in Romans chapter 2, or 12, chapter, or 12, 2, it says to be renewed, that your mind will be renewed. That's not just your brain. That's not just understanding or, or you know, getting scripture in you. If you've memorized scripture, it will do you no good until you experience it. So you can memorize. If that were true, all the theologians would be walking just like Jesus. And some of them are far from that. So you have to get that experiential knowledge of what you, what you have in your brain. But renewing the mind is not just getting scripture in you. That's a very small part of it. What it is, is, is renewing your mind, renewing your soul, really, your emotions, your will, your desires, your hurts, your pains, your character, all that kind of stuff, because your spirit is right with God instantly. As soon as you get saved, you're right with God. It's never, like Curry was saying, it's never a spiritual problem. It's a soulical problem. That's our problem. We're, we're wounded in our souls. We're weak in our souls. Um, and that's where the brokenness is, if you will. Okay, but we're not broken people. Because we're spiritual, our spirit's not broken. Our souls are broken, if you want to use that term. I don't even like that term, because I'm not broke. I'm not a Humpty Dumpty that God couldn't back, put back together again. Amen. He put me back together when I was saved, and now I had to realize it. And this is all that I did was take scripture, take these teachings that, that Curry has done, and apply them in my life, and everything changed. Like I said on Sunday, I stopped being a beggar. I stopped you know, trying to seek God's presence, because I am God's presence. People say, well, that's blasphemy. No, it's not. It's biblical because they said, they said, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere I go is holy ground. Everywhere I go, I take God with me. You know, we were at a meeting one time, and uh, this, uh, we're teaching a DHT, and this gentleman came in and took his, took his manual and goes back to the back, talks to my wife, and puts his manual down and says, I want my money back. I don't feel the Holy Ghost here. And, and uh, he said, I was at another meeting of this... Famous dude, and I really felt the Holy Ghost. And my wife said, well, we have no problem giving you your money back. I'll give you three times your money back. I don't care. It's not about the money. It's about the information, right? And it costs us money to print these, so that's, all, that's, that's why we do it. And she said, I know the Holy Ghost is here. And he says, well, how do you know that? She said, because I brought him here. So go find yourself a Holy Ghost. Right? You know? That's right, and the people people think that it's oh that's blasphemy and that's you're you're conceited. You know it's not. It's truth. You know, no nowhere in Scripture does Jesus say, "Well, let me go out and you know I'll pray till the Holy Ghost comes or I'll do this or no." The Holy Ghost came upon him, and then he started his ministry. This is all I need. We were in Mexico because we go, we go to Mexico quite a bit and teach for for months on end, and we were in this one town teaching in Tapalpa, and. God said to me, he said, this whole time that you've been waiting for me, but it was I who have been waiting for you. And that's, that's not just a word for me, that's a word for everybody. We're always waiting on God. You know, we're always trying to get God to move. God's never been stuck. Lord, never been stuck. We've been stuck. And we always blame it on God. It's so easy to blame everything on God. Why? Because we don't have to take responsibility for it. It's easy when you don't put responsibility, when you put everything on God and everything God, is God's fault, it takes the pressure off us. When you realize that everything is your responsibility, people don't like that, you know? And um, when, when God said that to me, it changed things. I've been waiting on you. The, the God of the universe is waiting on me as a Christian, and again, not just me, but as Christians, to step up, step forth, and get things done. Amen. So we did. And we've been on this five-year pursuit of truth, because um, I wasted so much time before that. Uh, like I said on Sunday, my family says, we never get to see you anymore. Well, come to Louisiana then. I always tell you where I'm going. There you go. You can come, come, come traveling with us. You know, I said, God got the first 48, or you got the first 48, the world got the first 48, God gets the rest. You know, whatever else is, whatever else is there, God gets the rest. And we'll, we will run this race. Um, this is how I honor God. This is always how we honor Curry and his family because they down, laid down the last 40 years of their life pursuing this. So this is, this is how uh, we try to change a world. You know, we have 14 seminars booked in Canada in the next couple of months. We go weekend after weekend. You know, we leave here tomorrow. We fly home 
and get home at nine o'clock at night. The next morning, we we drive north. Apparently, it's really cold and really snowy where we're going now. Um, we teach a seminar for three days. We come back home. We jump on an airplane, head to Texas for for a week to to help out with a new man that Curry's doing down there. And then we leave there, and then we go. You going? Yeah. All right. That had that was a resounding yay. So I was figuring you were going. <laughs> Um, and then we come back and we have a Swatch book, DHT's book, all this stuff, because people are waking, to, waking up to the truth of the word. If your Christianity was working for you the way it should, most of you wouldn't be sitting in here. Right? Because you know something's up. Now, maybe you're coming just to get a refresher or get encouraged, or maybe you go to this church or something of that nature. Um, if I lived in this town, I'd go to this church, for sure. This, this man's awesome, right? Because he won't compromise anything. Okay? And he did not pay me to say that, by the way. Right? But he has been buying lunch. So, um, But it's, we, we met in the fall. And right away, it was, we had this connection. We went out for lunch. And, and, I mean, we've just been talking ever since. And he's, there's no compromise in the man. That's what you want because he's never going to compromise for money. See, most people water down the gospel because it's about money. Right? So uh, before we get into this, that was just an introduction. We're going to show a video here real quick if we got that up. Um, I'm going to scoot over this way. So this is this is a little bit of time from when we went to Mexico last and did a DHT there a year ago. I could not have done this before, what you're going to see in this video. You know, the, the, the two healings my wife has seen while she's here, uh, just in the bookstore, wouldn't happen. We, we didn't have any idea that our media team, Crystal, that was with us, was actually filming this. She came over one night and said, I made a video for you guys. And this is just some of the highlight stuff. Look at that, eh? It's pretty awesome, that's what that is. So this is an outdoor um, kind of market area. Everything's outdoor in Mexico. But. It's downtown. This is a place called Menzanillo. It's about two and a half hours south of Puerto Vallarta. Stray dogs everywhere we would feed them, people would get not happy. So this is in the mountains. Uh, they have no running water there, nothing of the sort. We up, went up there and preached, and you know that, the man had bad eyes. This guy had bad kidneys, I think, um, bad back. And we prayed for this guy. His back was so bad, he couldn't even hardly move. He did that, and then he went and did that all on his own. Instantly healed, like instantly. His sciatic nerve was, was trapped in between two of his discs. She was deaf and mute part of our Canadian team other than the Mexican folks and this is we found out that the cartel had just gone to this guy's church and said if you don't stop doing what you're doing we're gonna kill your wife and kids so when we left in the dark there's no street lights running when we left in the dark you were thinking because there was cars following us you know? this is when we went out and hand fed some crocodiles some of these guys are huge they're like 700 pounds 800 pounds this was in a restaurant, and this lady got absolutely rocked by the Holy Ghost. Yeah, pastor stuff. I call these drive-by healings. We have drive-by shootings. Why can't we have drive-by healings? So this was at the DHT we were doing. This lady was, was paralyzed in the bed. She couldn't move. I wasn't choking him, he had a throat problem. This guy, the Holy Spirit moving on him like crazy. Pastor, she's a pastor. Watch this lady's hands, see your hands move? I'll tell you that story in a second. The one lady that I said, watch her hands move. It's hard for me to watch that. You know, I'll get emotional because 
because I remember that. You know, I remember teaching what I'm about to teach you, if I can get to it, um, and how people thought that their life was just God beating down on them. You know, that God was just basically an abuser, you know? And, and the way we look at God, if he does all these things to us, if, if somebody's ever, and I'm trying, not trying to make light of it at all, if somebody has suffered abuse in their life, the way we think God treats us, then that's supposed to, he does all these things, gives us cancer and hurts us and all these things to draw us closer to him, apparently. That's what they say, right? Then, then if you've suffered abuse in your life, then that should have drawn you closer to your abuser. It didn't. Right? It pushed you away. It, it, it made you a, a form of shell of who you're supposed to be or who you were. It strips away your life. It strips away your dignity. It strips away your hope. It strips away everything. Yet we say God does this to us, and he's a good, good father. And, it, and he, he's given me cancer, so I trust him more. He's doing all this. Stuff. Have you heard that? It's such a work of the devil. So this lady that, that held her tummy, she had... A, a botched operation in Mexico. And the doctors couldn't, whatever she had, I, I don't know what she had going on, but they couldn't fix it. They messed it up, and they couldn't fix it. And she was in constant pain. She was young. She, they couldn't fix it. So she came, and we prayed for her. And when she did that, I asked her afterwards, what, what happened? And she said, something shifted inside of me. That's why she reacted like that. And then you saw her smile. Because something moved in her internally. So the Holy Spirit went in there. I don't know what he did. Don't care what he did. He just did what he did. If he re-plumbed something, shifted something, fixed something, I don't, I don't know what happened. I don't know what they did. But he fixed it right there on the spot. Come on. How do you not let that drive you? You know? But there's no way that I could, I could have ever seen that before because I would have been a beggar. You know, I probably wouldn't have laid hands on her because if it's God's will to heal and God's will not to heal and all that stuff or set people free, what's the point of, of rolling the dice like it's some sort of, you know, craps game or whatever? You know what I mean? Well, we'll just roll the dice and see what God does. God's not fickle. And I had to learn that he wasn't fickle. I had to, lear I had to learn that God is, is solid. And he's, he, you, can, you can count on him. And I didn't know that for 17 years. You know, I, I served him like this. God, why can't you use me? And I knew him. I would sit in my truck and I would bawl my eyes out and I would look at my hands and I'd say, God, I know there's healing in these hands. Why don't you use me? What is wrong with me that you can't use me? Is there hidden sin in my life? What's hidden sin, man? If you know you're doing something wrong, you know what you're doing wrong. You know, there's got to be something. Oh, maybe, maybe it's a generational curse. That's what it is. So... Somebody said to me one time, do you have any, um, any, any background with the Freemasons or anything in your life? I said, no, I'm not that I know of. He said, check into that. I'm like, okay. You know, because he was known to be a prophet. Okay. I know. So I started checking into it. Got my mom to phone people I don't even know. Never met in my entire life to check out our, our background. That was so stupid. What, what's it doing? Creating fear. Even if, even if that was true, which it wasn't, but even if it was, I'm digging up a guy that's been long and dead. Because even though I was, I was in religion, I was still a Christian. I was just a messed up one because I didn't know anything about the Bible, really. There was a point in my Christianity I probably didn't pick up the Bible for two years because I didn't understand. Nobody can figure out God. Who can figure out God? Because God is mysterious. Right? Anybody ever hear? Like Curry kind of touched on it yesterday, but has anybody ever heard God works in mysterious ways? I will give everything in my bank account, which isn't a whole bunch, so sorry to, you know, <laughs> to anybody in here that can find a scripture in the Bible that says God works in mysterious ways. Give you as much time as you need, because you won't find it. There is no scripture in, in the Bible at all that says God works in mysterious ways. Not at all. But yet we've heard that so many times. Why? Because Christians are powerless. The people who stand behind the pulpit or preach or whatever, they don't know the Bible. They're just reiterating what they've heard. They're re reiterating what they've been taught. 
And if you're, if, you're, if you're doing that, you're moving a lie forward. So I started chasing around these generational curses in my life. I remember going into my kids' rooms at, you know, 1.30, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning when they're sleeping in the name of Jesus, I just break your curse, you know. If they'd have woke up, <laughs> I'm over them, you know. Man, what is wrong with this guy? I went in there, whatever sin my father did, my grandfather's, my grandfather's, grandfather's, grandfather, and go back 97 generations to try to figure that out. Yet the Bible says to not get caught up in vain genealogies. Hello. It's amazing what you can read. God said to me one time, it's, it's amazing what the eyes can read and the mind can't comprehend. Because I was thinking with a carnal mind, not the mind of Christ. And if you're in the carnal mind, you can't comprehend it because those things are spiritually discerned. So you, you can be at peace with God in your spirit and at war with him in your soul. So you literally can be at peace and war with God at the exact same time. Because if you're living out of the carnal mind... That's what's going to... See, your spirit is supposed to have preeminence in your life. Your spirit is supposed to be, quote-unquote, in control. Okay? For most... Because we're a three-part being. Spirit, soul, and body. Okay? The world has that backwards. They have a body, soul, spirit. If you ever look at it, if you go to like a yoga place or something, and you see the sign, and say, come in here and treat yourself body, soul, and spirit. Um, the Bible has a spirit, soul, and body because it puts the spirit first, and the world puts the spirit last. Okay? And by the way, there is no such thing as Christian yoga. That's right. At all. Okay? If your church is having Christian yoga to pay the rent, get out. Because you can't do that. It's based off Eastern of religion. Each one of those poses was to mimic a god. One of the three million gods. Three million. I'm trying to please one. And not that he's hard to please, but I'm just trying to live right. Imagine three million. It's like people who, you know, have 20, 30, 40, 1,000 wives. Dear Lord, I'm just doing my best with one. You know, 30, 30 years in, she's still here, so I'm, you know, I hope I'm doing all right. You know, but this whole thing with generational curses is I thought that, okay, this is why. There's always got to be a reason why God can't use me. There has to be. Yeah, it's because my mind's not renewed. It's because I don't believe him. I have faith enough to say he's my savior, but not faith enough to make him my Lord. And that's the problem, is most Christians have made him savior, but not Lord. If he's Lord, he will have preeminence in your life. If he's savior, you get, away with, you get to do whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, and you, you most likely won't be convicted because your, your conscience has been seared. So there's a, there's a purge conscience and a seared conscience. It talks about it in, in uh, Hebrews 10. The seared conscience is you can... Be desensitized, really, to something. And when you watch a little bit of TV, you ever notice in TV, if my wife and I were talking about this the other day, if you go back even 10, 20 years or something, actually, I was talking to George from Australia last night, and how when you call people sir or ma'am, you do that a lot down here, do it a lot in Texas, you never do it in Canada, never. And by hanging on with Curry so much, I just, it's in me to say y'all and ain't, and like I was saying on Sunday, and yes, ma'am, no, sir, that, that kind of stuff, right? Do that in Canada? I'm not my mom. I'm not my grandma. It's not about that. It's about respect. And the world has lost that. So how about you respect me and allow me to respect you? It's just, it's just a term. It's not an insult. But we live in this age of, of you know, perma offense. Christians shouldn't be offended. We shouldn't live by offense. So anyway, we need to get into this because I get you going for days about that. But I sought, I sought out these generational curse things. Um, there, there had to be a reason. There, you know, there had to be some sort of anointing that I'm waiting for. And this gentleman's anointed and I'm not anointed. So what does that do? It doesn't go, well, that's great for him. I'm really, I'm really happy, sir, that you're anointed. What does that say? What's wrong with me? Why am I not anointed? Maybe God doesn't love me. Maybe I'm not really saved. Maybe I'm not a Christian. And then the devil goes, yeah, you're right, you're not. And you start thinking, wow, I don't know. And then you get into this condemnation thing. And then you, you get into the, well, if that doesn't matter, then I get into a seared conscience, like I was saying. And the seared, you just get desensitized to things where things don't bother you. And like Curry was saying, you come into a DHT, you, you might not have noticed sick people, but when you leave... 
you notice everybody. I notice people that have band-aids on their fingers. Can I pray for you? It's the, the band-aid. You know? I know, but you shouldn't, you sh- you shouldn't have that. And unfortunately, um, well, not unfortunately, well, unfortunately for some people, whatever, people are afraid of me. Never understood why. You know, I used to do security bodyguard work. I used to honestly ha- get, get paid to fight for a living. Um, not, not mean, but to save people, to help people. That's, my job was to defend people. And uh, so when I approach people in the streets and say, excuse me, sir, can I lay my hands on you? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so you, you got to approach it a little, a little differently. I literally had one man, he was, he was in such pain, he was, he was hobbling across the parking lot. I was in a, a Dodge dealership and getting my truck serviced. And I saw him, and he was in such pain. He, was, he couldn't hardly walk. Uh, older gentleman, and he was sweating so hard because he was in such pain. I just wanted to help him. I said, excuse me, sir. I just, can I help you? you? You look like you're in pain. And he got, he went to his van as fast as he possibly could. And I said, I just, sir, I just, I just want to help you. Can I help you? I see that you're in pain. Can I pray for you? And he peeled out of that place like I was trying to rob him. You know? So I don't, I, oftentimes I, I try not to go out alone, you know, to help people. Because sometimes they think I'm there to rob them, you know? <laughs> but anyway, i got to get back to seared conscience. So you can live as a Christian with a seared conscience where sin doesn't even bother you anymore. And you think, well, this must not be wrong because I'm not getting convicted. God can't convict you because your conscience has been so seared. But in Hebrews 10, it talks about having a, a purged conscience. That, you should, you, that the, the believers should have no more consciousness of sin. Why? Because it's been purged, not seared. And the church is full of convicted sinners, not converts. There was, I think it was John Wesley, I think. He would, he would go around. I mean, these, these, some of these old timers were amazing. And he traveled 250,000 miles on a horseback, <coughs> preaching the gospel, sometimes five, six times a day, was tarred and feathered and, I mean, all sorts of stuff. And they had to, he, he, they actually had, we, we were just with Curry and, and George and everybody, we were just in uh, London, England. And we, we spent a month in Europe, but we ended it in London. And we went to John Wesley's house and his church, which is still active today. Amazing. I got to stand in this pulpit that he preached from the 1700s. And it's really tall. It's probably as tall as the ceiling. And he was really short, so maybe that's why he, I'm not sure. But we got to, he was like five foot two or something. But we, Curry and I got to stand and we have pictures and stuff like that. And he's like, take pictures of me. So I'm taking pictures of him. And, and it was amazing. You know, just to, just to stand up there and see what this man did. 250,000 miles on a horseback. And his, his legs got so used to being on a horseback that he couldn't sit in a normal chair. They made, um, they, they, they put a saddle, I think, on a, on a whiskey barrel or something. And that's what he sat on because of the shape of his legs. Relentless. And we have people that won't cross the street for somebody nowadays. These are the people that really changed the world. Guys like William Booth when started the Salvation Army like Curry was telling about, Right? But we have to get and live in a place where our conscience isn't seared. It's purged. Because that's where the condemnation comes in. It's not, easy, it's, it's, it's not hard to not sin. It's not hard to live right. It's not hard to have right motive. But it is if you think you're still broken. If there's no hope. See, I, I taught inner healing. See, I can say all this stuff because I lived there. I'm not just, you know, because I thought it up. I lived there. I taught inner healing. That you, need, you come back and this and where was Jesus and this and all that other kind of stuff and we've got to get you, you know, healed up. And I mean, soul ties is a really big thing. It's not even scriptural. You have one lineage. You have one father. That's it. You're a blood relative. That's it. And I know people are saying, well, then how come I'm in so much pain? Because your, your soul hasn't been renewed. Your, your pains, your wills, your emotions, your character, your desires, all that stuff hasn't been changed. That's all part of renewing the mind. It's, it's because God made you new. He's, he, he didn't even just put you back together again. He recreated you. Brand new. So all that stuff, technically, I'm not telling you to go back in your past because we never do that. But a lot of people live there, so it's very fresh in their minds. That stuff technically didn't even happen to you. Because you're a new creation. It's amazing. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I had lived a perfect life. I'm not. I'm, you know, in, in the sense that, you know, nobody hurt me or harmed me. Or, I'm, not, I'm not saying that at all. I lived there. I just don't talk about it because it doesn't matter. That didn't happen to me. 
It's like, it's like a scar. I have a big scar on my arm right here. There's no pain to it, but I remember it, but the pain's gone. But we relive that. We have it in our mind. I'm not trying to sell any product, but at the book table, mind renewal. If you can get a hold of a mind renewal, that'll help you. Renew the mind to who you are and, and, and the truth of the word of God and how to, that when you think about certain things, your brain becomes more focused on those things. And that's why it's at the forefront because you're, you're constantly building, you know, new branches in the brain to remember those things. And that's why the pain is so real. But if you, if you get the word of God and graft it into every part of your being, that's what will be at the forefront of your mind. That's why I don't live the way I used to live and think the way I used to think and live in the condemnation and the guilt and all that stuff because that's not who I am. That's not how a son or a daughter of God lives. They don't live under that weight. You know, so you always have people talking about soul ties and, I mean, all these different soul connections and things like that. It is not biblical. You're connected. We're connected as one, as the, as the body. And the Bible says when one hurts, the other hurts. I get all that. But I'm not connected to people in my past. I technically have no past. Think about that. Because it's forgiven. And if God doesn't remember, like Harry said, I think it was yesterday, God doesn't forget your sin, he just chooses not to remember them. So it's a choice. Can, can God remember them? Sure, if he wanted to. Because God doesn't forget anything. But he chooses not to remember them. It's the same thing for us. That whatever we've done in our lives or whatever somebody's done to us, I'm not making light of it. I'm not saying it's easy. It's not, forgiveness can be very hard. But you choose not to remember it. And everything changes. And people get caught up with all the soul tie stuff and all this generational curse stuff. It'll keep you in bondage forever and ever and ever. And people die broken. But having the kingdom of God living in them. Like I said on Sunday, that's like having a million dollars in the bank and dying broke under a bridge. It's a choice. See, all this stuff is a choice. God has given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. What are we doing with it? We should be the most victorious people that have ever walked the face of the earth. It's amazing. And I'm living that out now. Seriously, I'm not, like Paul said, I'm, I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet, but I'm well on my way. And it's an amazing, an amazing journey um, to live how we're living now. Like I said on Sunday, I used to walk around, head hanging low, depressed, sad. Not really depressed, but just sad and just downtrodden, you know? And um, now I walk into every place like I own it. Head hung high, looking up, and I have life. To give away. And I had life in me before, but it was, it was so packed down by the soul, by the emotions, by the, you know, the pains, the hurts, and the sorrows, and, and all that kind of stuff. It, it literally just pushed the spirit down and made the spirit ineffective. You know, I remember Curry saying a story one time that, that God asked him, um, when, did, when did Jesus cease being the Christ? I don't know. I mean, if, later on today, he'll probably correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure this is how the story went. And he said, well, I don't know. When did the Christ, when did Jesus cease being the Christ? And God said, apparently, when he moved into Christians. Because Christians don't do what they're supposed to do. Because he can't be the Christ. See, Jesus Christ, Christ isn't his last name. It's his position, the anointed one. Christ moves into you. Heaven moves into you. The kingdom of God moves into you. And that's where he stops being that because he can't move through you. It's, pretty, this, it's very sobering and very real. That he stops being Jesus if you don't be his hands and feet. But yet we come into church and sing that song, I'm his hands, you know. We're, Karen and I were talking about this the other night. We paralyze him. And, I, and we, I, we were talking about it, I think, right? We paralyze Christ. Because he's the head of the church. And we're his body. And we have, nobody has any problem admitting that we're the body of Christ and we're his hands and feet and all that other kind of stuff. But what happens if the hands and feet and the body can't move? It's paralyzed. But what happens? The head can move. So the head's not the problem. The body's the problem. We paralyze God from moving. 
we're supposed to be doing this stuff. And it's because of stuff that I'm trying to get to, which we'll do in the next session. Hey, you know, stuff comes out. You know? But again, this is where I lived. I hadn't... I barely had hope. Some days I was just barely hanging on. You know? Um, I, I wasn't suicidal or anything, but I just existed. You know, that, that every day was, was a struggle. Because... You, you read in scripture of all these messed up people doing incredible exploits for the Lord. Incredible stuff. You had Noah, drunk, naked. I mean, all this stuff. You had Peter, you know, he's shooting his mouth off, chopping people's ears off. I mean, you know, you have people denying Christ. I mean, all this stuff. Messed up, fighting amongst themselves. I'm greater than you. Who's, who's greater? What are we going to, you know? Fighting. I'm not saying we should fight. We should try to live in peace as much as you can, as the Bible says. But these people weren't so spectacular. They were messed up because then that brings better glory and bigger glory to God that he can change somebody. So we will look at this and we, and we think, well, you know, if God uses these people, I would, I would take my Bible and I would read this stuff and how messed up these people were and I would see what they did and the miracles, and the signs, and the wonders, and all that kind of stuff. And I would go to my pastor, and I would say, why don't we see this? He'd say, well, you just have to wait. You just have to wait. He's a great man. He's a great man. He really is. You just have to wait. You just have to wait. Okay, I guess I'll have to wait. 17 years. It was like a prison sentence. What does a person do in, what does a person do in prison? Wait. You wait. And I waited, and I waited. And I waited, and God waited, and God was patient. Thank the Lord. He was patient, waiting for me. And I thank God now that he's smarter than me. Because if he would have put me in, if he would have given me what I wanted back then, I would have been perpetuating lies. I'd have been putting in people in the bunch thinking I'm giving them freedom. And I couldn't have given them freedom. You know, maybe bits and pieces like God will save you sort of thing. But that was about it. I couldn't give them true freedom. I couldn't give them deliverance because of that stuff, because of the a religion that was sitting on me. You know. Now, we'll end here in, in a couple of minutes just for a quick break. When we go down to Mexico, we see greater miracles in Mexico. And just not even Mexico, but just different parts of the world because the people are different, way different. And I, I, I used to not believe that. But I do believe that. They're more hungry. You know, when, you, when you have meetings, they, they're not ashamed to come up front or any, anything like that. We've seen such demon deliverance in Mexico. An hour where, where we were staying, an hour away from that, they're still doing, um, apparently, I don't know if it's now, but it was four years ago when we first went, um, human sacrifice. Witchcraft all over the place. And we, would, we got invited to a person's home. She's a school teacher. Nice as pie. Wonderful little girl and a nice husband. And she was just bright and shiny. And just, you'd never, you'd never think it in the natural eye. But she said, we got some problems in our house. And you need to come and, could you come and help us? Every other church, every other ministry said they won't come because they're not prepared. They're not ready for this stuff. Said, we'll come. I'm prepared. Man, I'll tell you something. I used to, when I would think of demon deliverance, I was scared of it. Because the oogie boogie monster is going to jump on me. You know, if I, I, can't, I can't go do that because he's going to jump on me. And he's going to affect me, and I don't want to get demon-possessed, so I'm afraid of this stuff. That's a lie from the pit of hell, too. So when I started learning this stuff, I was fairly new in this. And they said, will you come? Yes, I will. So my wife and I went, and I took, we took a couple people with us because I don't speak Spanish. And we went into their home, and um, she, we have video of it. You know, we keep it kind of hidden. We've shown it to a few people because it's, it's very sensitive stuff. You know, that this stuff, we don't want to blast it on the internet. It was just ridiculous. People do that for YouTube hits, and usually it comes back to them making money. So we don't post that stuff, but we have shown it to a few people. Her body was on the ground contorting and screeching and screaming. And I'm just over and saying, in the name of Jesus, you'll come out and you'll leave her alone right now. Her husband, his eyes rolled back into the top of his head. It was all pure white, just white of his eyes. And he's screaming, and his body's literally on fire. Those are good times. Not the fact that that's what's happening, but the fact that the devil's getting out. We've seen people throw out blood. We've, there's one lady, we, uh, 
she said, will you come to our house? Um, her daughter had a hole in her heart. And it was a hole in her heart. Her heart was too small or something like that. I can't remember. It was something wrong with her heart. She was like, was too small for her chest or something. And she was like 14 years old and she had a liver problem or something, a kidney problem. And they said, will you come, will you come to our house? There's some stuff going on in our house. We have a, 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 a woman that's, that is like a ghost or spirit that's floating around in her house, okay? Those aren't human spirits, by the way. Those are demons, okay? I mean, when you're going to somebody, you know, that's reading your palms or something like that, it's a familiar spirit. You're not channeling your grandma. You're channeling a demon that knew your grandma or, or mom or whatever the case may be, okay? And, and they just know it. So that's, that is, none of that stuff is, is, is good and it's 100% demonic. But we went into this house and the mom said this is where, there was two bedrooms, it was a Mexican house, they're all really small, but there's two bedroom doors opposite each other but facing one another. And she said, this is our daughter's room and this is our room and this is where the woman stands, this dark figure, and stares into her bedroom at nighttime. Okay, no problem. I, greater is he that's in me than he's in this house or in this world. I got this, no problem. So we went in there and uh, I went into the kids' room. Nothing there. Went into, and I say nothing, not physically see it, but spiritually discern it. Went into the mom's room and the, the dad's room and I was like, this isn't right. So I go into the child's room, nothing. Go back to the parent, and I did that three or four times. And I'm thinking, okay, there's something, there's something up here. So I, we sat down on the couch, and we had a bit of a team with us. And I looked at this, this girl, and I said, I said there's, there's, first of all, we started, I think we started praying for the mom, is what it was, in the house. And then her, her, her friend comes in and says, you have to help us. There's something happening to this girl outside. So we're praying for this woman in the house, getting her delivered. And outside the house, this girl is manifesting. That's what the Spirit of God can do. So we said, okay, get her in here. So we get her in here. We sit her down on the couch, and I'm talking to her. And I said, the stuff that's happened to you happens to you inside this house. And she said, yeah. And this is kind of a graphic story, and I'm so, but this is real. This is what we deal with. I said, this, it happens in this house. She said, yeah. And I said, it doesn't happen in that room. It happens in this room behind me. And she said, yeah. And I said, and the people that are hurting you are in this house right now. And she said, yeah, that's true. So then I got angry, you know, and... You know, you kind of rise up a little bit, and you, you want to take things into your own hands, but you don't. It's not right. You know, you realize you get mad at the devil, not at the people. So we went into the, into the room, and someone was praying with the, with the mom, and I got in there, and I just started casting this thing out of her, and I was mad, really mad. And she started, the devil started speaking. The devil gets a look of arrogance, and you just want to slap that thing, I'll tell you. <laughs> But it's arrogance, and looking at you in arrogance. And you're like, I said, I'm not afraid of you, devil. And then she was, she was, because the devil was speaking, but it was obviously coming out of her mouth in Spanish. I said, devil, what are you, stupid? I don't speak Spanish. Speak English. She spoke English. She'd never been outside of Mexico. And I just, we just got after it. And she hit the cement wall. I mean, I don't, I don't know how she wasn't hurt. Only the, only the glory of God and the protection of God saved her. She hit that wall so hard and laid there all slumped over. And then she got up and she was, she, her whole countenance had changed. And she's looking at me and I said, what are you thinking? She said, I, I'm thinking you're mad at me. I said, I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the devil that's been affecting your life and ruining your kid's life. That's what I'm mad at. But she was free. And her child got completely healed. They went to the doctor, and her heart was normal, and her kidney was normal, and all that other kind of stuff completely. God set them free. This, this is what this teaching can do for you. And I, I've, got, I've got many stories, but we're going to give you a break for 10 or 15 minutes or something. Um, we'll come back, and, and we'll try to look at generational curses. So, like Curry says, have you found the section on generational curses? I didn't even tell you what page, so I can't blame it on you. When we come back, page 123. Okay, we'll be right back. <laughs> 